so the last couple of things we're going to talk about today, and we don't have very much longer, uh, so we're probably going to get it early, Mark. I think we are not going to, yeah. Uh, so we'll talk about open science. Uh, so the reason Git is super useful for us is because it allows the free sharing and collaboration um, of information and code. Uh, now, we as scientists uh, can be at times very siloed in how we work. Um, sometimes there's certain cultures around science and certain spaces where we keep our work to ourselves. We don't collaborate very well. We, uh, we don't share our data. Um, in the field that we are working in, which is uh, computational science, if you're working with code, it's almost necessary that you need to make your code available, right? Um, and I have read many papers and uh, assessed many projects in my time where someone has done something and their code just is not there. Like, and I can't, I can't assess it. Um, so we want to make that code available in all cases where we can. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, first of all, we might generate some data and that data can be stored in an open repository like Zenodo. Uh, and we can maybe even give it, its, give it its own DOI, digital object identifier. Okay. We can take the code that we've used. Um, <laughs> I've just seen Thomas's comment. Um, we can take the code that we use and put it onto a rate repo like GitHub or Bitbucket. Um, I love GitHub. Um, and we just keep that up to date. Um, now you can keep a draft of your paper on a private repository. You probably don't want your draft public, but um, you want to have it in a private repository so that you can have collaboration with your colleagues and co-authors. Um, and then when the paper is ready for publication, you can post it to a preprint server um, like the archive. And I know that people have com uh, people fight about how to pronounce that, but I'm calling it archive. Um, okay. So then um, when you publish your paper, you will have links to the code, the data repositories. You will make it easy for people who are reading your paper, reading your research to know where to go to find your base code and the data that you've analyzed. That is good practice. Now, there are some caveats to that. Sometimes data for various reasons, if you're in the biomedical field, like you know, I work with human patient data, that may not be something that I'm able to uh, release, uh, if not in a de-identified way. Uh, so that there are some caveats around that, but generally speaking, you want to make your data available and as open as you can. Um, and you want to make sure that you have links to that. Okay. Uh, this is important. It's, it's good scientific practice. And we know that the more open your work is, the more it is cited, which is uh, hopefully a carrot for all you young scientists. Um, so there are some resources in here to look at what open means and how to actually perform open science. So you can read that at your leisure. But Version control is one aspect of uh, like the process of why open science or how we do open science. It means that we uh, can keep track of who did what and when they did things. We can collaborate with our colleagues. We can have things code stored in a central location. We can make that code publicly available. Um, and you can have documentation of all the things that you did. So, you know, there is some attribution to you. Um, you know, there's, that, that is important. Um, so uh, there are some, some, some tips here. So one is that um, if you're on a work in progress, um, you probably want to start with a private repo. Uh, like if you're still doing a scientific project, you don't, necessarily want people to have access to half finished code. Um, and that's that's important as well, because it, as it here says, prevents unintended use of your research, right? Um, theft of intellectual property is a real issue in science, unfortunately. Um, now, you can always start with a private repo and then you can you can you can make it public later on or you can you can create a public fork. Uh, so in, 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 it's probably ideal to chat to your supervisors about how to set this up 
um, now you, you, us as your mentors, we can we can guide you through the technical details of doing this. But in terms of like how and what to share and when to share it, that's a conversation with your supervisors. Um, now, uh, code should be citable, or you would want to be able to cite code, and anything that is uh, held in a repo is citable because you can say uh, the code or the data that you have created can then be someone else can provide a link to your repo and that way they can reference your work. That's really important as well. Um, and hopefully you all know about things like the archive, which is a preprint server. And that is uh, how you can share your academic papers with the community before it is accepted for publication in a journal. Okay. Uh, now there are some caveats to this as well. Some journals have bad rules about uh, whether or not you're allowed to do that before it's accepted. Um, but there is a growing consensus that this is actually quite important. Uh, so, but, but if you are intending to submit to a journal, um, probably do read up on their guidelines as to whether or not um, you're restricted from submitting it to a preprint server first, okay? Um, uh, so how to find appropriate data repositories. Um, you can just Google for them. There's there's things like FigShares, uh, FigShares, Zenodo, Dryad, um, Open Data Repository. Um, there are sometimes field specific repositories um, for depending on the kind of data that you work with. Um, I might, for example, as a as a geneticist, I might uh, choose to upload some of my sequencing data to the uh, NCBI um, a database. Um, so it really just depends on what you're doing, what kind of data it is. The you know the things that your field recommends. Um, there are certain recommended repositories here. Uh, this is uh, a PLOS, a link to PLOS one. Uh, I'm, I'm also going to look at nature. So this has a couple of uh, recommended repositories you can look at, uh, especially by field. Uh, nature also has similar guidelines as well. Um, so. I might have some raw sequencing data that I might put on the genome sequencing archive. Yay! Uh, so these are good. Uh, uh, these are good resources for you to look at. Um, if you have very large files, which I almost always do, uh, it, you can't just put them on a Git repo. But what you can do is you can do you can use something called the Git large file storage. Okay, this is an extension for Git. And what it allows you to do is it will upload the large file to a remote server of your choosing. And then what actually gets pushed to Git, your Git repo is not the file itself, but a pointer to a remote server hosting that file, right? So Git is not set up for you to push and pull very large objects but you can push and pull pointers to that large object that is stored in a more appropriate location. Okay. So that is open science. Open scientific work is more useful and more highly cited than closed. Uh, sorry, just with that, with the large yep. file storage, is that um, like, what do we point to? Is it like, do we, we wouldn't point to like a local directory or something, right? So, uh, how how does that work? No, here? so if for example, if you have something stored on Zenodo, right, you can have a pointer to that Zenodo. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, no worries. Attribution, uh, attribution. Another little quick section. Um, we're almost we're getting to the end here. Just walk you through this last little bit. Um. So if you're writing software, um. Or, you know, if you've got, if you're saving your code somewhere, uh, you typically have, you will typically see something called a licensing file. Uh, this is quite important. Um, now, this typically is found in the base directory of the repo or in the base folder of the software. Um, and it's important to include because it indicates how the software can be used and modified. Um, Everything, including software that you write, is considered intellectual property and therefore has certain protections. Um, but if your 
if one of your collaborators chooses to take your code and then and you know make some changes to it, uh, you could maybe sue them for copyright infringement, but maybe you don't want to sue them for copyright infringement, and maybe you want to make it very clear how you intend for the software to be used. So to do this, we we typically include a license. So if we go to this website, chooseolicense.com, um, we can look at some of the options for licenses. Um, the GNU GPL license is very common. Um, this, as it says here, allows people to do almost anything they want with your project except distributing closed source versions. So this is a very, very common uh, license. Uh, it is my favorite, I think. There are some limitations. There's no warranty and it has a limitation of liability. So if that's important to you, for most people, it will not be. Um, the MIT license is another very common license. It's very short and to the point, and it, be, it, it basically says you can do anything you want, um, it, including um, it distributing and making closed source versions. Um, so th you, there are plenty of different licenses. Um, so for example, if you're working on Apache, you need to use your Apache license. If you're working in uh, GNU environments, you typically want to be using the GNU license. Um, so there are some, there are some uh, things that you need to know about, about uh, working within communities of code, right? Um, so that's something to look at, but there's plenty of choices for you to look at plenty of different licenses you can have a look at. Um, so, but again, the most common are, for, the most common for open source software are the MIT license and the GNU license. Okay. Now, here are a couple of the little factors that uh, inform your choice of license. So I'm gonna let you uh, read this in, in detail in your own time. But picking a common license is important because there's, they're established and there's familiarity and then people know the rules around them. If you use a GNU license, people will see GNU GPLv3 and they're like, oh, I know what that is. Okay, so you know, it is good practice to use a, a common license that is very established. Um, now, you need to... There are some there are some other caveats, which is the licensing choice that you use may be dependent on your institution. So for example, in certain institutions, the software or code that you create is uh, maybe it could in some contexts be considered the intellectual property of the university, or there may be restrictions on the kind of licensing you can apply to it. So this is something that you can uh, investigate um, and if you're working with software typically you've already accepted a license for use okay so if we want to look at git we all know and love git uh, i'm going to click on this copying file and we're going to investigate what license it is and it's a gnu general public license okay so you've accepted by through using git you accept the terms of this license, right? Now, uh, another important thing that you do, and uh, very, it's very common. Um, I'm, I'm again in in the field of um, bioinformatics and uh, you know computational genetics. So um, there are a lot of tools that are written specifically for the kinds of data I work on, and they. In most cases, the most common tools are published in, in a journal article. So the, the tool is introduced and described within a journal article. Uh, and so you can give people instructions on how to cite you. And the best way to do that is using a citation file, right? Citation.txt, you can add that to your the main directory of your repo um, to tell people how to cite you, okay? Um, you don't need to have a publication to make a piece of software or code citable. Um, it, it does make it easier if you have your code or software on something like a GitHub, and then you can ask people to cite the GitHub link. Uh, you can definitely ask them to do that. That's no problem at all. Um, 
So, yeah. There is also a link here to more advice on, oh, that needs to be updated. I will, I will fix that link in due course. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, making, being, being clear about how you want your work cited is important because otherwise, if I'm writing a paper and I use your software and I don't know how to cite it at all and I'm a bit lazy, then I probably, if I was not a great person, would just ignore the citation. Um, but if you have made it easier for me to find the citation, I'm likely to be like, oh, yeah, copy paste. I'm putting that into my Word document. Um, okay. So that is attribution. Finally, we're going to talk about IDEs. IDEs are integrated development environments. And the example we're looking at here is Visual Studio Code. Uh, would you type the text file as a RS or something else? Um, I would just have it as, yeah, like I, I have to be quite honest here. I don't remember at all the structure of a risk file. I think I've just only ever downloaded them and imported them. Uh, but I would probably use a similar, um, similar, uh, style as listed here, whatever that style is. How do you add the training session into VS Code? Um, so uh, in what sense do you mean, Amber? Um, yeah, so let me... Wait a second. Which screen am I sharing now? Okay, I'm still sharing the browser. Um, ah, sorry, there's just so much on my screen at the moment. Okay, so here is my VS Code window. If I go here, terminal, new terminal, it will open up something called the Windows PowerShell. Now, this is... Sorry, I'm not, you're still in the browser. Am I still on the browser? Okay, let us <laughs> try to fix that. Give me one moment. Uh, da, 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 da. So the the um Visual Studio Code looks like this, and here I'm just going to show you. I've got I've got my Git repo opened up here. Uh, I, I can I can make changes, uh, and I can from here commit them. Right, um, and I can also open a terminal window um, that opens in. Uh, this is going to be open in something called WSL, which is like the uh, Windows subshell for Linux, um, which you can install manually. Uh, you can use this to do things in a terminal sense. Like I can say uh, ls, I can say uh, touch paths.txt. I can, I can do all of that. And you can see that now I've got a change that I can commit. Um, save all and comment changes. Okay, so I can do all of that, but I, I um, the, the way to do that is to go here, 
terminal, new terminal. But so you can use it in a sense as both a code editor. You can operationalize Git from here and you can also use the terminal down here, but they kind of work in, in slightly separate boxes, right? Um, does that make sense? Does that answer your question? I'm so sorry um, if this is not... <laughs> Yeah, okay, so I'm just looking at the, um, so Thomas has put a little thing in there. So if you want to, yeah, uh, I have never SSH'd via Visual Studio before, but I'm going to just assume based on the link that's in the chat that, that is possible. Uh... Okay, amazing. Uh, that's for someone else to read in their own time. Um, okay, but essentially, uh, Visual Studio Code. Um, the the benefit of using something like this is um, you can write text, commit it, do all the things you need to do um, without having to necessarily work on a command line system where you're typing nano all the time. Okay, so um, for example, you can open the folder where your uh, planets directory is s stored on your local machine. Um, it'll ask us if we trust the authors of the files in the folder. You can, if you, because we've written out ourselves, we can say yes. Um, and then you can add, hopefully this worked. Did I, no, did I push that? So I'm about to push. Cats.txt, which you saw me create in Visual Studio. Okay, so you can you can actually do all of those things via Visual Studio. You know, edit the files, and um, push pull, all of that stuff. Uh, so if you were working, uh, if you wanted to create a completely new project, you would make a folder open a folder and then click initialize repository. Okay, there's a git button here. That button is a git button. So if the folder doesn't have a git repo initialized in it, you have the choice to do so. Um, and you can make some changes and then you can commit them. Okay. Um, you can push those changes using push branch in the git menu. You can also pull and you can also view the comment history. Okay, now to push this to a remote repository, you click on the sync button. Now, because I have, because the folder I was working in here in Visual Studio was already um, initialized, I don't need to tell it where the repository lives. Um, but you can do so if you want to start from scratch as well. You can tell it where to connect. Okay, so um, it's a matter of personal preference as to whether you use Visual Studio Code or whether you use another IDE or whether you use an IDE or at all. Um, but it, it is quite popular. And it does have a lot of utilities incorporated into it that allow you to um, sort of just click buttons to get your workflow set up. Okay. Um, I think that's basically it. So what I'm gonna do, let me stop that share quickly. Uh, I'm going to uh, 
Are we dog people or cat people in this chat? Someone told me in the chat. Cat. Cats are winning. <laughs> I'm going to make a new folder called cats. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open open folder. I'm going to go to cats. Okay, so I've just opened a folder called cats, a brand new folder that I've created. Uh, do I trust the authors? Yes, I do, because the author is me. If I click on the Git icon here, it tells me the folder doesn't have a Git repo in it, so I can initialize a repo. Okay, and what I can do is I can make a new file and I can just say, uh, cats are my favorite animal. Okay, and I'm gonna save that as cats.txt, cats okay? So now I have, I've made a change I can actually click on the file to look at the changes. So before I had an empty file and now I have added some text. Okay. Uh, I can stage that change by clicking on the plus and then I can commit it. Um, it will ask me to add a comment message, which I can say uh, info about cats. Okay. And, I'll, and now, oh god, yep. Yeah, so then you can you can um, connect it to your GitHub account to to sort of connect it to a repo. Okay, so that is how you would use this system.